Hello, Mr. Ritter. Thank you for giving us this interview. How are you? I'm doing very well, thank you. Yourself? Our viewers would like uh, to hear your short lecture on geopolitics from you. What do you think? What's happened now on the planet? What happened in the planet? The planet is going through a period of uh, immense realignment. Um, and there's a lot of instability that's attached to this realignment. The, uh, the, the principal realignment is away from um, American hegemony, American control of the world, to a, um, a multilateral approach where uh, other uh, global and regional actors um, are able to um, make their uh, opinions uh, not only heard, but acted on. Uh, we see China uh, becoming a global leader. We see Russia um, asserting itself um, in, in Europe and around the world. Uh, we, we see India, we see the global south, the, um, you know, the, the what used to be called the developing nations. Well, they're developed now and now they want their, uh, they want to sit at the table as equals. And, uh, and this is the transition that's taking place. And it's, uh, it's manifested itself um, violently uh, in Ukraine. I think uh, the Ukraine conflict is uh, was an effort by the United States to use Europe and use Ukraine as a vehicle to weaken Russia. Uh, it has failed dramatically. Um, we see it with uh, Israel right now. Um, you know, Israel has long been an American. Um, uh, ally is a very, because we don't have a treaty with Israel, so there's no alliance per se, but Israel has been an extension of America. Um, and the world was just told that you have to deal with it, that you can't question Israel, you can't stand up to Israel, that uh, Israel is America. America will always be there to protect Israel. And we're seeing right now that the world is not accepting Israel's ability to do anything it wants to do. And the, the conflict in Gaza is proof positive of that. Um, notice that when the uh, Islamic world, the Arab world, um, finally woke up that something has to be done about Gaza, who did they turn to for the solution? It wasn't the United States. The first place they went is China, which shows China's growing clout. Um, we have a world that's struggling on what to do about American um, economic dominance. Uh, de-dollarization is a uh, is a trend uh, people are starting to look for other uh, reserve currencies other um, economic realities upon which to pin their future hopes on uh, one exception i think was just saw uh, seen earlier uh, yesterday when argentina had a presidential election and they have a president who's promoting the opposite he is trying to re-dollarize so it's a struggle it's give and take and all that but all of this leads to a tremendous amount of instability, political instability, economic instability, uh, geopolitical um, instability, wars. So that's that's where wars. the world is. To, the world is to. More wars. Do you see a big war on the planet? In order to fight a big war, you need people who are capable of fighting a big war. One of the things that uh, Ukraine has shown us is that Europe is not capable of fighting a big war. They tried. They tried to use Ukraine as a proxy, and uh, they failed. Uh, NATO was an empty shell. What is NATO? NATO is nothing. We are in NATO. Bulgaria is NATO. We are very proud because we are in NATO. Well, good. I'm, I'm proud that you're proud, uh, but you're nothing. You stand for nothing. You are nothing. Oh. Oh. What, what are you, Bulgaria and NATO? What do you stand for? Do you stand for human rights? Do you stand for democracy? Do you, what, what do you stand for, and what are you willing to die for? Because NATO is a military alliance. So what is it that Bulgaria is willing to die for? Are you willing to die for Ukraine? For How many NATO, Bulgarians? No, for Ukraine too. Yeah, I understand. So but that's now, my point. What What is NATO? NATO is nothing. It's a fantasy. It's an expensive fantasy. But in the end, NATO failed Ukraine. What is NATO? Now we have... Uh... I think Northern Front in Ukraine and Southern Front uh, in uh, Palestine. What is common and what is different in the two conflicts? Between Ukraine and, uh, and uh, Palestinian Israel conflict. Hamas? Yeah. I think what's the same is that you have a, a Western-oriented uh, narrative 
um, that promoted Ukraine and is promoting uh, Israel. And that narrative is coming up against some hard realities. Um, the hardest reality for Ukraine was Russia. Nobody got Russia right. Nobody got Russia right. I'll say that one more time. Nobody got Russia right. The entire West got it wrong. They were going to crush Russia economically. Everybody made fun of the Russian economy. Europe would pray to have the Russian economy today, a healthy economy, an economy that is, you know, low inflation. Um, uh, not, they don't have to borrow money to exist. Uh, you know, they, they have budget surpluses. Um, everybody made fun of the Russian military. Look at the Russian military today. It's the most capable military on the planet. Combat tested, well-trained, well-equipped, victorious. A key aspect to any military is its mindset, the mindset of victory. Russia right now is a military that has tasted victory. They know victory. They know how to win. Isn't that the team you want to play for? The team that knows how to win? Or do you want to join the team that has never really played in the championship? They don't know how to win. They don't know what they're going to do. Russia's played in the championship. They beat NATO. They beat NATO. NATO was beat by Russia. NATO has no chance against Russia. So I think that um, they got Russia wrong. And I think what's happened here is that uh, the West has got Israel wrong. See, we, 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 we've always accepted Israel as America defined it. No one ever paid attention to the crimes committed by Israel. Nobody paid attention to the crimes uh, that are perpetrated on a daily basis against the Palestinian people by political Zionism. When we spoke of Israeli settlers, we weren't allowed to be critical because to be critical meant that you were criticizing political Zionism and therefore you were automatically called an anti-Semite. But that narrative's changed. People have challenged that. They're saying, no, we can be critical of Zionism without being anti-Semitic, that Zionism is an evil. Um, but we're not saying that being Jewish is an evil. There's a difference. And that's changed. The Israeli, the pro-Israeli lobby, the pro-Israeli uh, narrative doesn't want it to change. In the United States, for instance, if you speak out against Zionism, you're called anti-Semitic. But that's being pushed back on. Uh, the Arab world, which had long abandoned Palestine, is now rallying to Palestine because the crimes that Israel is committing are so horrific that they can't be ignored. You can't ignore what Israel is doing to the Palestinians. So I think the big thing that connects the two is that the American-controlled narrative is collapsing in the face of reality. And it's not just a PR thing. It's a narrative it's that that is attached to geopolitical posturing. The American geopolitical posture in Europe has been largely deflated by NATO's defeat in Ukraine. And America's geopolitical political posture in the Middle East is being deflated by not only Israel's defeat, but the fact that through this defeat, Israel has behaved in a way that clearly identifies it as a nation with total disregard for the norms and values associated with international law. And so that's what I think what we're seeing here. We're seeing the world no longer willing or able to buy into a narrative promoted by the United States. The world will not buy the American ideology no more. Well, they're not. I, I, look, as an American, I would love for my country to have an ideology that you would buy into. Yeah. I would love to be the good guys. Mm -hmm. I would love to be the nation that solves problems that doesn't make problems. Wouldn't it be nice if the United States learned how to be at peace with Russia so that the Bulgarian economy wouldn't have to worry about how to exist without Russian energy or without Russian investments or without Russia? I mean, Your economy is so unhealthy, just like the rest of Europe, because you're not allowed to have a free economy. Wouldn't it be nice if you were liberated economically to have a free economy, to trade with whom you want to so that your economy functions free market, in an ideal yeah. fashion? We dream for free market, yeah. Yeah, but you can't have a free market as long as you're associated with the United States, because the United States policy is about sanction, sanction, sanction. How can you have a free market when all we do is sanction? We've sanctioned you. The, Magnitsky, the global Magnitsky, Magnitsky Act, we, we sanction you. 
isn't Bulgaria a sovereign state? Isn't Bulgaria as a sovereign state responsible for issues of corruption within Bulgaria? Why is America reaching into Bulgaria and telling you how to run your country? Because you're a prisoner to America, because you've surrendered to America, because you've bought into this vision that America controls the world. I'm not you a prisoner join of America, Mr. Ritter. Well, that's the problem of the people, though. You may not feel like you're a prisoner. You may not want to be a prisoner, but you are a prisoner because you have a government that has surrendered to America. That's the problem. Let's be back on the Palestinian conflict, Hamas Israel. I think there has to be a, a, a Palestinian state. I don't think there can be peace without a Palestinian state. And unlike the past, Israel has lost the world. The world, for the first time, the world wants a Palestinian state. In the past, the world has given lip service to a Palestinian state. They say, we believe in a Palestinian state, but they don't believe in it. They never acted on it. On October 6th, no one was talking about a Palestinian state. No one. I challenge you to go into Bulgarian media and find anywhere in Bulgaria where people say, the number one problem today is there is no Palestinian state. No one was talking about it. Today, everybody's talking about a Palestinian state because it's recognized that that is the only way to bring peace in the region, to resolve this, to control Israel, not by destroying Israel, but by making Israel a nation state that lives in peaceful harmony with their neighbors. And one of their neighbors must be a free and independent Palestine. So yeah, there will be a Palestinian state because there is no other option. But when? That's a different question. Um, and the, the, the answer comes, when will Israel be defeated? Because the only way there's a Palestinian state is for Israel, as it currently exists, to be defeated. We see the elements of that defeat happening. This right-wing coalition that Benjamin Netanyahu has gathered around him is on their way out. They're being rejected by Israelis and the international community alike. What will replace him? Um, may not be sufficient to accept a Palestinian state, and then they will have to be defeated and replaced. The Israeli army is being defeated as we speak. Defeated as we speak. They're not winning in Gaza. Killing civilians is not a measurement of military victory. Um, they're not winning against Hezbollah. They're being defeated by Hezbollah. So I, I think the fact is Israel has lost. And the question now is, when will Israel realize it is lost? And then when will they realize that to continue, they could lose everything and that their only way to survive is to agree to a Palestinian state. And the moment that happens, there will be a Palestinian state. This could take years. Okay, but uh, when, is, when we speak for uh, two conflicts, how does the media approach the two conflicts, Ukrainian and Palestinian? I think the media bought into fiction and fantasy dictated by the United States early on. Everything about Ukraine was good. Everything about Russia was bad. You weren't allowed to be critical about Ukraine. You weren't allowed to talk about the corruption. You weren't allowed to talk about um, the Nazis. You weren't allowed to talk about anything. You just had to say, Ukraine is good. Ukraine is good. The Wall Street Journal and the big American media outlet newspaper um, was one of the biggest cheerleaders for Ukraine. But the Wall Street Journal just ran a headline the other day that said it's time for the notion of a magical Ukrainian victory to be a uh, stopped because there will not be a Ukrainian victory. There will not be a Ukrainian victory. It's impossible for Ukraine to win. It's impossible for NATO to win. It's impossible for the United States to win. So we're going to have to learn how to deal with a victorious Russia and what that means. That's the new reality. And the media, and, and how did the media make this change? Because the reality became so evident that it couldn't be ignored. That's that's what happened here. The media, it, the situation got so bad that the media could no longer believe its own lies. The same thing's happening with Israel. The, the situation with Israel, the crimes committed by Israel are so evident that the media can't lie about them anymore. They have to reluctantly tell the truth. But we'll know that the media changes when they change their narrative, not about the inevitability of a Russian victory, but about the fact that Russia is not an enemy worthy of going to war with. That's the truth. That's the real truth. The real truth is that Russia didn't start this war. And the real truth is that the Palestinians didn't start the war with Israel. Um, and when, as soon as the media starts to talk about that, stop talking about Israeli war crimes, although they're there, but talk about Palestine's right to exist that the Palestinians are an occupied power. Stop talking about Russian victory 
and start talking about how to peacefully coexist with Russia, mm -hmm. how to stop viewing Russia as a threat. Does NATO really want to spend 300, 400, 500 billion dollars building an army they will never build? I mean, think about the burden that's going to be put on Bulgaria. You know, you're, you're going to have to, to rebuild your military. To, to, to what end? To what? Do you really want to go to war with Russia? Didn't you just see what happened to Ukraine? Because that's your future. You can't beat Russia. NATO can't beat Russia. Now, Russia has a military that's combat-tested, victorious. They know what winning is. When was the last war Bulgaria won? Do you have any officers today that know what military victory is? Russia is full of officers that know what military victory is. They are confident in their ability to win. You don't want to go to war with Russia. You want to be friends with Russia, not surrendering. I'm not saying anybody surrender. I'm mm -hmm. saying to peacefully coexist with Russia as equal sovereign states. Ukraine could have done that. They chose not to. They were destroyed. And in this moment, how Europe changed its positions today according to the new developments? <laughs> Same as always. It's funny. funny. It's funny. It was, Europe's Europe a joke. It's a joke. joke. Europe's a joke. What is Europe? What is Europe? Are you European? Yes. Or are you Bulgarian? I'm very proud European. I was very proud, proud European. member of uh, Eastern Bloc, but now very proud European. And But what does that mean to be a European? Are you a Pole? Are you a Brit? Are you Italian? Are you French? What does European mean? What is a European? I know what nobody a Bulgarian knows, is. Nobody knows in Bulgaria what is uh, to be European. But, but if you don't know what a European is, how can you be a European? Yeah. How can you say I'm a proud European, but when I ask you what does it mean to be European, you say, I don't know. Because there's no such thing as a European. There's something called a Bulgarian. There's something called an Italian. There's something called a Frenchman or a German or a British. We know what those are, but we don't know what a European is because it doesn't exist. That's why it's a joke. And it's a tragic joke because Europe existed, could exist as long as there was economic health, as long as something called the Euro, the Eurozone, the, the single currency. We all could live together in peace and harmony, blending the cultures. But now what we're finding out is there is something called a European, or not, uh, uh, something called a Pole and a Bulgarian. How, how do we know? Immigration. You see, if there's no European, if there's no, if there's no Bulgaria, then immigration doesn't matter. Let the immigrants flow in because it's Europe, baby. It's Europe. We're all European. But now you're finding out that the immigrants that come in, they're not Bulgarian, and that's important if you live in Bulgaria. Yeah. And suddenly it becomes important to become a Bulgarian and not a European. Now you have to defend Bulgaria, and that's what's happening. But you must know now in Bulgaria, our government say our goal is Euro. Our goal is Schengen. Our goal is united with Europe. Uh, it's like in communistic time. I mean, goals are something. I, I My goal is to climb Mount Everest. Yeah. I can announce it loudly. I can stand up right now and say, I'm going to climb Mount Everest. And yet, I'm 62 years old. My cardiovascular system probably isn't what it needs to be to climb Mount Everest. I'm not trained at high altitudes. I don't know how my, my body doesn't work in the cold. And so to climb Mount Everest is really an impossible task. It's very easy for a politician to say what their goals are. It's harder for a politician to do something, to do something, to accomplish something. Mm. Have realistic objectives. What does it mean to be part of this, that, and the other thing when it doesn't exist? When it doesn't, there, Europe does not exist. Europe is a fraud. You're like a judge. Europe does not exist. NATO is defeated. This is a little bit... Uh... Very scary things in Bulgaria, but I well, very important. Scary, but, but it should be scary. It should be scary for Bulgaria should, should be scary. because what what is NATO? What is NATO? It's a North Atlantic Treaty Organization, but it's a military alliance. A military alliance to do what? What is the purpose of NATO? Don't say to defend Europe because that's a lie. Was NATO defending Europe when it launched a war of aggression against Serbia in 1999? Nope. Was NATO defending Europe when they uh, launched a uh, regime change operation against Libya in 2011? Nope. Was NATO defending Europe when they got involved in nation building in Afghanistan? Nope. 
Iraq. What is NATO? NATO is an extension of American foreign policy objectives. That's all NATO is. NATO doesn't stand for anything related to Europe. It only stands for the United States of America. That's NATO. After this, uh, I have a very important question. Who is uh, Zelensky now? Dead man walking. A dead man walking. He's a failed politician. He's a failed leader. He's a failed human being. He has failed at everything he set out to do. This is a man who ran to be president of Ukraine telling the Ukrainian people that he would crawl on his knees to Vladimir Putin for peace. And he was given the opportunity to have peace. All he had to do is sign up to the Minsk Accords. But he couldn't go up against the Nazis who said, I will hang you by the neck until you're dead. So he didn't have the courage to bring in the Ukrainian military and kill all of the Ukrainian Nazis, which should have been done. Kill them all. Annihilate them. Destroy the political parties because they are evil. You don't get to threaten a democratically elected president with death if he doesn't do what you want to do. And yet he was threatened by the Azov Battalion, by the right sector, by Sloboda, that if he doesn't do what they want him to do, they will kill him. So he yielded to them. And in doing so, he yielded to NATO, to the United States. And he allowed the conditions to exist for a war with Russia. The war he said he would crawl on his knees to Putin to prevent, he allowed it to happen. And then he allowed himself to be transformed into this larger-than-life character, Winston Churchill, the new Winston Churchill. And the world rallied around him, sent him hundreds of billions of dollars of military equipment, hundreds of billions of dollars of financial aid to prop up a military that shouldn't have been allowed to fight, can't fight, but we kept them alive on life support, your life support, by the way, all of your equipment, and yeah. your money kept them alive. You're paying the pensions. You're paying the salaries. Ukraine is a dysfunctional nation led by a dysfunctional leader, an artificial man, an artificial creation. And now what's happened is that he has failed and nobody believes in him anymore. He is an empty shell of a, of a leader. And he can't even say he did it for the Ukrainian people. He allowed the Ukrainians to be butchered on the battlefield. He allowed the Ukrainian economy to be collapsed under Russian bombs. He allowed Ukrainian citizens to be displaced by the tens of millions. He is one of the biggest criminal entities in the world today that because because of him, so many people have died. And he will pay the ultimate price. He has no future. I say I think it's a little bit early to judge. To judge? Okay, to well, judge. we'll find out. Uh, yeah, I, I think Nicholas Ceausescu thought, this, thought the same thing right before yeah. the machine guns opened fire on him. It's yeah, a little too 90s. early to judge me, he was saying. 1990. Who are you to judge me? I understand this. But who is next after Zelensky? There might be an interim person. Uh, maybe Zeluzhny will lead a military coup. Um, maybe another Ukrainian general will lead. But it doesn't matter. Because ultimately who will rule Ukraine will be dictated by Russia, the winner. Russia will follow through with its promise to denazify Ukraine. This means that there will be a government in power that will do what Russia demands be done to remove the Banderists from Ukraine's political fabric. And that's who will be in charge. Ukraine has lost its right to be a sovereign state, tragically. It bought into the West, and the West abandoned it, abandoned it, literally abandoned Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And Ukraine will be left to its own devices. You know, here in Bulgaria, journalists are making fun with the question of uh, whose Crimea is. However, I ask you, whose Bulgaria is it? That's a mean question. Uh, mean, it, yeah. Bulgaria is yours. You own Bulgaria. I'm not sure. Well, I, I agree. I, I understand what you're saying, but it should be that Bulgaria owns Bulgaria, that Bulgarians, that the Bulgaria is a sovereign state, etc. But we come back to the fundamental question: What is a Bulgarian? Mm -hmm. What is a European? Yeah. And if the Bulgarians, if 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 a Bulgarian says as a response that, I mean, I don't know if your answer was facetious or not, but if a Bulgarian says I am a proud European, that tells me they don't know who they are as a Bulgarian. Yeah, Because at the end of the day, to say whose Bulgaria is it, you have to say what is Bulgaria. And whose is it implies ownership. Do the Bulgarians own Bulgaria? Do they Are they proud of Bulgaria? 
Are they willing to die for Bulgaria? Is this that which defines them? When they wake up in the morning, do they say the mountains of Bulgaria, the soil of Bulgaria is me. I am Bulgaria. This is my country. I love it so much that I define myself by this country. And if they don't do it, then it's not their Bulgaria. They don't own it anymore. They gave it up. We have politicians convicted under the Magnitsky law. You know this? <laughs> you know the names? I, I do. I do. I'm very familiar with it. And the the same politics, they are very persistent, they are Euro-Atlantics. How did this happen in our country? They are under Magnitsky law, but they are persistent Euro-Atlantics. It happened because Bulgaria stopped being a sovereign state. That Bulgaria allows the United States to dictate uh, economic outcomes, political outlook outcomes. You, 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 you sold out to America. Um, you did it because you sold out to Europe. You did it because you stopped being Bulgarian. Mm -hmm. You did it because you you said that it's more important for us to um, be part of the dollar system, that it's more important for us to be able to uh, do transactions in the SWIFT banking system. That's the most important thing in the world is the dollar, the dollar, the dollar. Therefore, we will allow America. Why do you let the American Treasury Department come in and tell you what to do? Because that's what you've done. You don't have a president anymore. The president of Bulgaria sits in Washington, D.C. It's the secretary of the treasury, apparently, because they can tell Bulgaria what to do, how to act, how to behave, what laws are important, what laws aren't important. The same thing with the secretary of state. The, Tony Blinken is more a president of Bulgaria than your president because your president has said, OK, we're going to let this. You know, a real nation would declare war against America over something like this. Now, I know you're not going to. It's a sort of a stupid thing to say. But a real nation would say, we're not going to put up with this. We reject this in its totality. We reject this. And this is where Bulgaria has leverage. Because you know you are a NATO member. Yeah. But you don't have to be a NATO yes man. You mm -hmm. could actually use your NATO membership and say, we're going to start saying no. You are a member of the European Union. But you don't have to be a European Union yes man. Because what are the consequences? What are they going to do? Put the Magnitsky Act on you? They already did. They already did. They're, they already sanctioned you. They already proved that you're nothing. You're nothing as a nation. So yeah. why doesn't Bulgaria stand up and say, this is who we are? And if it comes to the point where being a member of NATO costs you your sovereignty, maybe you shouldn't be a member of NATO anymore. Maybe you picked the wrong side. Maybe you should be on the other this side. Is the side this is side that doesn't have a Magnitsky Act. This is heresy here. Of course it is, but 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 tell me where I'm wrong about your sovereignty. Are you a sovereign state? And the answer is no. No. Not with the Magnitsky Act. You're not a sovereign state. Uh, let's speak a little bit for Mr. Biden and Mr. Xi Jinping. What happened in San Francisco? What happened in San Francisco was the Biden administration is desperately looking to engender stability. Um with Chinese relations up until the election in 2024. Uh, with the war in Ukraine and the, the war in Israel, uh, the Biden administration can't have a war with China over Taiwan. And, the, and they were heading in that direction. Their rhetoric was getting ahead of the policy. It was getting out of control. We weren't talking with the Chinese. Um, we have a situation where Nikki Haley, a presidential candidate, could travel around and say hateful things about China and the American public is starting to believe her. It's totally out of control. And if left unchecked, it would probably have led to a war with China that nobody wants. So what happened is they agreed to start talking. Nothing was solved. No problems were solved. Mm -hmm. They deal, They still disagree about everything, but they agreed to start talking. And, and more importantly, and this is an important thing, they started a cultural, uh, or to, to breathe life into what's the most important aspect of resolving problems, academic exchanges and tourism, meaning they're encouraging, not discouraging, Americans to go to China and Chinese to come to America and to have talk. Why? It cools the temperature down. Yeah. When you start to interact with people, for instance, if you, you know, Let's say you got mad at me today for what I said, which you have every right to do. I'm not saying you don't have a right to do it. You get mad at me. You start calling me names. And I start yeah. calling you names. And we're talking. Like, 
And then I convince everybody that Bulgaria is e evil and full of idiots. And you convince everybody that America is like me and full of idiots. How do we how do we win that? If you and I are talking across each other, nothing's going to happen. But if I send 100 people from my community to Bulgaria and you sent 100 people from Bulgaria to my community, they'd say, wait a minute. It's not as bad as they're saying it is. We they're good people. We like these people. We we can get along with them. There's commonality. And it, it diffuses what you and I have done by pointing fingers and calling names. Right now, we have a lot of name calling between China and America. But by encouraging the flow of humanity between the two nations, you cool the temperature down. And that's the most important thing that happened in, uh, in San Francisco is to cool the temperature down, to reduce the temperature. You didn't solve any problems, but you're cooling the temperature down. Look, if Joe Biden was was... Let me let me answer it this way, because I, I, I have to be politically correct or yeah. I should, my wife will get mad at me if I answer it the way I want to answer it. Okay, um, 80 percent of Democrats today say that Joe Biden shouldn't run for president in 2024 because he's too old. And when they say he's too old. It means that he's not mentally capable of doing the job anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, he's he's a man that has problems that related age. We all know. Look, I'm getting to that age, too, uh, where people ask me and I speak my mind. You know, I don't have any you know limits anymore because I'm an, I speak my mind. But when you're the president of the United States, you don't get to speak your mind. You represent the nation. Yeah. You have to cool things down. You have to be responsible. You should have talked to your secretary of state and who said, if you call him a dictator, you undo everything we're trying to accomplish here. But Joe Biden doesn't have any control over his head anymore. And he got out there and he said something he should never have said. Now, here's the good news. The Chinese responded the way they were supposed to, condemning it, the foreign ministry, et cetera. But Xi Jinping knows that Joe Biden isn't in control of his head. And so the Chinese are saying America's in a very difficult position where their leader, the president, is not really leading the country. Other people are managing it for him because his mental capacity is extremely diminished. And so the Chinese are not going to allow that to undo this broader objective of stability. So they'll condemn it, which they have done, but they're going to move forward. It's not going to change anything. But what does this say about America, that we're led by somebody like this, that is clearly not up to the task of running? And here's the bigger question as an American. Who's running America? Who? I did, you know, you know? we don't know. We, we don't know who's running America. You know everything, Mr. Ritter. What is this? Uh, I, this is very scary. Nobody it's knows who is running really America. Scary. It should be scary because America is a constitutional government. The Constitution lays out, you know, the, the, the chain of command. The president is the chief executive. Then you have a vice president. In this case, the vice president is alienated because she's not very good. She's been pushed to the side. Nobody wants her at all, not even the Democratic Party. So she's pushed out. The third in the chain of command is the Speaker of the House. Well, we just saw Congress uh, paralyzed over the Speaker of the House. Um, so now we come back to the president. The president's mind doesn't work. Now, should they be honest to the American people and say his mind doesn't work? You have to invoke the 24th Amendment of the Constitution to remove an incapacitated man and replace him with the vice president. But everybody looks at the vice president and says, nope, we don't want her to be president either. Um, so if you can't do it constitutionally, what happens is you manage the presidency. And that's what's happening right now. We have a managed president. And who's doing the managing? Probably the chief of staff and the presidential administration, whom nobody voted for. We no voted name. for a president. But who is this guy? Uh, I'd have to, I'd have to uh, look it up. The fact that I don't even know his name off the top of my head means that we're in deep trouble. Mm -hmm. um, but my point is that we, we have a situation where people, the American people didn't vote for, are managing the president of the United States. And, you know, it's one thing if the secretary of state is said, OK, the president's incapacitated, I'll run foreign policy. The secretary of state was nominated by the president, but ratified by the Senate. So there is the people have a connection to the secretary of state. We have a connection to the secretary of defense, but we don't have a connection to the national security advisor, Jake Sullivan. 
Nobody voted for him. He was appointed by the president. And yet he's one of the most important advisors to the president who's managing this president. The chief of staff. We didn't vote for the chief of staff, but the chief of staff manages the daily calendar of the president. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one thing if the president's brain is working. But in this case, we have a president whose brain doesn't work anymore. It works sometimes, but not all the time. So he's managed by people we didn't vote for. We didn't elect. It's not just a scary situation. It's a dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have uh, information, something, some military information on China's new Navy? How is it uh, superior to the American one? Do you know for the new fleet, China's fleet? You know, China has built a fleet that's a, they, you know, they're building a blue water Navy. Um, it's not superior to the American Navy because a lot of what China's done is tried to replicate the legacy systems of America. For instance, a Chinese aircraft carrier is a Chinese aircraft carrier. It's not magic. It's not as good as an American aircraft carrier. We've perfected the art of aircraft carriers. Nobody will ever build an aircraft carrier as good as ours. But the aircraft carrier is a dated system. It's an old system. Um, it can't survive in modern warfare. So the fact that the Chinese have built a blue water Navy around an aircraft carrier means that they have mirrored American power projection. The same thing with their submarines. They can build good submarines, but their submarines aren't as good as ours. You know, where where China outdoes the America, I think, is in um, it's the same thing with the Russians. They're building more ships, a larger Navy. Um And it left unchecked, you know, China could do, but China, remember a Navy exists as an extension of the nation that it represents. America is a global uh, country. We, we have projected our power globally. So we have alliances around the world, ports where our ships will come into. We have bases around the world. We can support this, this blue water Navy. China doesn't, they can build ships, but where do the ships go? Mm -hmm. Where's their foreign bases, et cetera. So China's blue water Navy still has limitations in power projection. Limitations of e Yellow Sea, just in Yellow Sea. Yellow Sea, they can go down the South China Sea. But once you get out of that, they've got no support network. Mm -hmm. So the Chinese Navy is nowhere close to what the American Navy is. The same questions from the Russians. Do you have information for the new Russian avant-garde missiles? Do the Russians really have an advantage to missile uh, weapons? 100%. Look, uh, Russia warned America back in 2002 when we withdrew from the anti-ballistic missile treaty. They said, don't. That's a foundational treaty. It defines everything. Because with without missile defense, your basic missiles will get through, you know, and, and, and then mutually assured destruction. But we decided to build a missile defense. Um, and we bought, we got NATO to buy into it. You know, those that place in Poland, that place in Romania um, that the Russians don't like. There's a reason why they don't like it, because those places are designed to shoot down Russian missiles. So Russia said, if you're going to build missile defense, then we will build missiles to defeat your missile defense. Vladimir Putin warned about this in 2018. Mm -hmm. And everybody said, well, he's just talking. I mean, I love it how people just ignore Vladimir Putin. I, I you, you withdrew from the ABM treaty. We asked you not to do this. You didn't listen to us. Are you listening now? He asked. And apparently the answer was no. Well, today they've deployed the avant-garde, but they've also deployed the Sarmat, uh, a super heavy. The avant-garde is a, is a warhead. Um, it's not a missile. It's a yeah, warhead yeah. that goes on, but it's a hypersonic maneuvering warhead that cannot be shot down. Mm -hmm. Cannot be shot down. There's nothing on this planet that can shoot it down. And so all that missile defense that, The United States sold that NATO bought into. Again, I come back to ask for Bulgarians, why did you join NATO again? Uh, but that's your business, not mine. Um, but now Russia has a, a warhead that can't be shot down. And which means that if you ever want to go to war with Russia, they will destroy you 100%. So Bulgaria should be praying that of the avant-garde warheads that are being put out there, none of them have Sophia written on it. It's very scary and dangerous conversation in this moment. Because NATO will never protect you. NATO can't protect you. That's the ultimate thing here. There's nothing that can save you from this missile. And it didn't have to be this way. Russia didn't want to build this missile. Russia didn't want to build this system. 
Russia was looking to peacefully coexist. Russia was looking for responsible arms control. The United States used NATO as an excuse to deploy missile systems that threatened Russia, and NATO did nothing about it. Where were the Bulgarians when we put the Aegis Ashore system into Romania and Poland? Were the Bulgarians in the street saying, don't do that, because eventually Russia's going to build a missile with a warhead that has Sophia written on it, and we can't stop it. NATO can't protect us, because that's where you are right now. NATO can't protect you at all. Please speak for Poland and Warsaw, not from Sofia. This is not a joke. But you're part of NATO, so you're part of the problem. Yeah. You chose to be part of the problem. So Russia will make you part of the solution. You're part of NATO. You voted for this to happen. NATO is a consensus-driven organization. Nothing happens in NATO unless all of NATO agrees. So you can't sit there and say Poland and Romania. No, 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 no. You voted for it. You said you wanted this. Now you pay the price. You're responsible. We voted. You don't know. You Bulgarian didn't vote for NATO. Didn't vote it never. I'm saying that Bulgaria as a member of NATO yeah. voted in NATO for this to happen. You I'm may very... not have voted for it, but your your country did. Your, your government yeah. did. <laughs> Okay, uh, what do you want to say to the ordinary Bulgarians? What they, what do they not tell us in Bulgaria? And why? Well, I don't think it's, I don't think it's so important to talk about what do they not tell you. What I would mm -hmm. say the ordinary, the average Bulgarian is, who are you? Who are you? What do you stand for? What do you believe in? You don't. It, it's not about waiting for someone to tell you something. You can tell yourself when you know who you are. Be honest with yourself. Who am I? What am I? What do I believe in? What will I fight for? We all know that we'll fight for our family. We know that. We want a better world for our, our children. We don't want our children to ever have to fight. We want them to live in peace and harmony. But to do that, we have to interact with the world. We have to interact with our neighbors. So when we interact with our neighbors, is it better for us when we meet our neighbors to say, I am me. This is who I am. This is what I do. This is what I'm about. Or to come up and say, I don't know who I am. I don't know anything about who I am. I'm on a mission of discovery and a journey. The neighbor's going to be like, well, you're weak. Uh, you stand for nothing. So when the town council gets together, your vote, no one's going to listen to you because they don't know who you are. They don't know what you stand for. So my thing with the Bulgarian, this is what I tell to everybody. Be proud of who you are. There's nothing to be ashamed of to say, I am a Bulgarian. There's everything to be proud of it. You are a great nation. You have the potential of being, you You are a lovely nation, beautiful people, culture, yeah. history. Be proud of it. Own it. <laughs> but I'm Bulgarian. I'm very proud with this. But uh, it's very suspicious. Uh, is my government Bulgarian? I would say, no, your government's European. <laughs> <laughs> I like your humor. It's a little bit black humor. <laughs> I receive black humor from you. I want to say um, um, thank you very much for this conversation. It was uh, very important uh, you to speak to our public because our media is a little bit um, Western. And these guys who teach us uh, for freedom of speech now they declined the, the freedom of, of speech. No, it's and the same thing in America. We're a nation that defines itself by the First Amendment. Freedom of speech, freedom of press. There isn't freedom of speech. And there is no free press. Um, no, I, but we have I to think, fight for it. Yeah, we must fight. Uh, I think what we do now is freedom of speech. Somebody will not like, but uh, this is freedom. Thank you very much, uh, Uh, Mr. Ritter, thank you very much one more time for your time and for this interview. Well, thank you for having me. It's been an honor and a privilege. Thank you very much.